So I'd like to look at the uh, first two verses of Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things, thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. Now the Lord is love. And he has a, uh, a whole orientation about loving his creation with the fullness of himself. He is committed to give himself fully. That's all he knows. He does not want to give his love by bits and drops and pieces. He wants to give you all of himself. And that was behind the Lord's revelation to Moses about building a tabernacle, which would be the temple. Building a place where the Lord could rest with his people. The Lord would like to rest with his people. The word rest connotes also comfort, special place. The Lord would like to have a special place among his people where they could experience his comfort, where they could know that he is there for them, and he himself desires to be with us. It's not in the way that we could put it in human words alone. There's something much greater here. But there is a dimension of God that he would like to rest with his people. It's part of his nature to give himself to those whom he loves so completely that he would become the home for his people. And so numbers of these worshipers are coming into the temple and are bringing offerings but the problem, brothers and sisters, is they are focused on the, ex on the external. They are focused on doing it in a particular way. It might even be, quote, unquote, the right way. But they're not focused on the disposition of their heart, the center of their being, why they exist. The Lord wants us to make a place for him in our hearts hearts. That is, we can be able to say, the sole reason for my existence is to create a place for the Lord to rest. Where the Lord feels at home. That is, what he experiences in heaven is, has been now the conditioned part of our soul and our spirit so that he finds that familiar. But what happened is, is these worshipers lost perspective. They didn't think it was about the heart. They also lost perspective fundamentally in that they forgot who God really is. They forgot who God is. I mean, <clears throat> have you, it's a rhetorical question because I know the answer. <laughs> have you ever heard anyone say that God is boring? All this is boring. Well, stop and think, how can God be boring? 
I mean, he created all things. He has all wisdom. He desires to communicate himself, literally and intimately, with all those who call upon his name. He deeply loves us. He is infinite. I mean, you go back about who created everything, and you end with God, and then you ask the question, well, who created God? Who created God? It's good to pause and think about that. Who created God? And you don't know because there is no other answer. You're now outside of normal logic. Why does that make any sense? The point is, is that we know virtually nothing in regard to eternity and life itself. But these worshipers already figured out what they wanted their lives to be like. Their great sin was not only their heart wasn't there, but they were coming to God to get stuff. They wanted security, and they wanted certain things. When people begin to come to God and they're looking to get stuff, they've already made whatever they thought God is into an idol shaped around their own desires. And they might get stuff and they might think they had just been fortified in their understanding of God. But the reality is the evil one just deceived them. And God will be boring to them. Because after you have stuff, what is there? More stuff? I mean, the reason they did not tremble at the word of God was because they did not have a contrite and humble spirit. They didn't have perspective about God was so great and that God was offering himself, but on his terms, which is so much more wonderful than the terms that we would provide. How does God become boring? That's like impossibility. You have to ask, how does it happen that people could actually hear the gospel or the word of God and come away, that's boring, there is an answer, of course. There is an answer, and it has nothing to do with God being boring. Nothing to do without God's word not having the ability to raise the dead, to create everything, and just like that. It has nothing to do with the power of the word of God. It has something to do with the disposition of the heart. There is a way of thinking about God that God will not oblige. He will not fit in our little shoebox of dreams and ambitions. He cannot fit there. He will not fit there. But if we continue to relate to him out of our desire, am I getting what I wanted from him? Then we will not understand his word. We will not know the living and true God. We will be living in a fantasy of our own making designed by a heart that is centered on ourselves. So these people would have the arrogance to relate to God on their own terms. How often does that happen? And why does that happen? from the absence of receiving the word of God for what it really is. Someone reads the word of God, I'm not understanding that, this is not doing it for me, as opposed to saying, what is missing in my perception of this word? God, reveal it to me. If we don't do that, we will substitute our own meanings. And they will not lead to life. We'll have made, how does this happen? It happens by us adjusting the word of God so that in general we can live our lives on the created plane 
without supernatural interruptions. That's why it's boring. You need the supernatural interruptions. You need the face of God in the midst of it. You need the voice of God. You need the fellowship of God. You need the presence of God. I mean, you need that. It's not just good for your spiritual side. You were created for that. Loss of perspective leads to tweaking of the word of God so it doesn't have the power that it used to have because it's not the word of God anymore. It's something that we can situate in our situation. Rather than a word that actually will inhabit our center of our core so that we can truly welcome him inhabiting us and our whole life. Us and our whole life. Life, not a good worship service, whole life. He wants that. Why? Because he loves our whole life. He loves us. So he loves us. He wants to rest with us. He wants to reveal himself. That's exciting. He wants to give himself. That is that actually we have ongoing experience and transformative experience of God where we would in turn become more like him. But what if you've given up on that? What if you don't have that expectation? You won't tremble. What if it's okay just to come to church or just to pray a prayer or read the Bible? What if that's just okay? Then it means there's something about expectations, about who God is, and, about, and a wrong perspective about who we are. I mean, we were made in God's image and likeness. Most people don't really get that. I was just reading... Um, as I'm apt to do at times, reading about the reality of hell, actually. And I've mused about it a lot. And sometimes there's this debate, is, it, is hell's puni punishment eternal or not? And the reality is, is that the first question is, did God make you in such a way that you don't die? Is there something about his image and likeness in us that is so unique to all of creation that there's something in us that will never die? An inherited immortality from God. Yes. Is heaven just for a while? Eternity is forever wherever we happen to be. And I say this only for one perspective, for only one purpose. There's much more I could say about it. But people, especially in the Western culture, have lost a reverence for who God is and who they are. And so it's difficult for them to hear the word of God as an opportunity for encounter instead of they just hear it as words, and so they treat it just as words, and they're trying, and they're trying, and they're trying, but they still have lost perspective, and it's still just words to them, and so it is boring to them, and so it doesn't give life. But the reality is that you and I are made in, in light of an eternal design and pattern, and we will live forever, one place or another, beginning now, beginning now. And God himself is eternal. Who made God? Silence. There is no answer. You don't know. There is no knowing. There is an end to all things, and he is the end of all things. That should cause us to have a fear in a good sense, brothers and sisters. There's something that we fundamentally don't know about life and about purpose and about meaning that can only be revealed. We're not, if we don't if we don't revere that reality, we'll make our own. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what a lot of people do. I mean, what is life for? Life is not for having longer life. Life is not for any specified purpose in and of itself just on the earth. It's not doing a lot of stuff. It's not doing a few stuff, a few bit of stuff. It is living with God. Because some people might say, well, I'd like heaven, but I don't know if I want to live with God. You know, have him live in my house, have him live with me. Well, that's what heaven is. We don't tremble because we don't have perspective. Because we are so embedded in the culture that tells us that our purpose <coughs> and how we feel and what we want is so important and doesn't speak to us about who we are fundamentally. And so we forget. And that's what happened to these worshipers. So what happens here? It's like someone has come into the word of God and somehow done something to the words that siphon, it, siphon its power out of them. You see, the word of God is supposed to help us to repent. It's supposed to open a door to glory. It's supposed to open a door to greater faith, to an awareness of greater love, both in ourselves as well as awareness of the love of God. The word of God is supposed to do that. If our hearts are set on God being God and that he is who he says he is, we will say, my life is meaningless regardless how much people think I am successful. If I am not, First of all, pursuing a deep love for the one who loves me. If I am not pursuing him and knowing him as he is, as the reason for life. And the word of God makes it clear, if we don't reset the very center of our beings that way, the word of God, as powerful as it is, will not lead us into God, but may actually anesthetize us. Because what happens when you hear the word of God and it doesn't prick you anymore? That's anesthesia of the spirit. Uh, sister shared today that the Lord would speak in parables because out of love for people, knowing that the more and more they knew, the greater their judgment. And if people really cared about the word, they would pursue him or seek the Lord in some way to find out what these parables mean. But if they don't, really don't care, well, that's their judgment. First off, they don't care. That is already a sign of the beginning throes of death. They don't care. And then secondly, it protects them because since they don't really know what it is the Lord had said, they're not as responsible. See, it's amazing how the Lord is. He loves us so much. He wants to tell us the truth. But he knows if he forces himself on us, that our culpability is even greater. That's why he's left a part, a big part, in his relationship with us for seeking. We have to hunger because we care. We know how much we care by how much we seek. So what happens? Why does the word 
not have its power. We have allowed our hearts, our desires, brothers and sisters, to be entangled with other loves that prevent us from hearing the word clean. It's like <clears throat> in the stock market, if you were to um, if you were to be privy of, of certain knowledge, like say you were a someone who would be selling stocks and you happen to be on the board of one of the, the companies that you are selling stocks uh, for, that you would have to make sure that you let people know that because otherwise you'd be accused of actually giving advice based on personal gain. You know, the more stocks you sell, the more it goes up, and the more you profit personally. personally. When we are invested in something else other than the kingdom, there's a vested interest to protect whatever it is that we consider a treasure that we put to an aside. There's a way where we don't want to hear everything because it might dip into that area. And so we're afraid. That fear prevents us from hearing. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? The fear of the Lord perspective gives us ears to hear accurately because we're saying, well, what else is there but him? What else could I be living for but him? I mean, I will be before the great I am face to face someday. What else is there? I said before in Isaiah 66, and actually, I'd say, I mean, I don't know, maybe a great portion of Isaiah, but especially Isaiah 54 to the end of the book, which is chapter 66, really is speaking about the people of God coming out of exile. We would say it's actually helping them come into revival. We are talking about a recipe of revival. The first thing is perspective, brothers and sisters. Revival is nice, but it comes to a place when we understand Revival is not nice. It's a matter of life or death. Because it is a fellowship with God himself. I think I cut out somehow. No? Okay. There we go. So I'm going to look at a church that was really revived. Again, the word, as you know, revived means simply alive. Made alive. God is life. There's no life outside of him. So, when we're um, talking about that, that, um, that that's our goal, to have this fellowship with God the way the early church did, like in Acts 2, the presence of the Holy Spirit moving powerfully. People were so in touch with the love of God. Here's, here's a sign that you know the Spirit is moving. They don't call their stuff their stuff anymore. Because the love is so great, they're not thinking stuff is that important anymore. Investment in stuff dulls our ability to hear, doesn't it? So the Spirit of God was moving in such a way that they really truly believed they were brothers and sisters. And they came before the Word of God, and they were not just having Bible study. They knew it to be words of life. What they read and studied, they put in their life. God was present with them. God had shown himself to them. And so people just saw and sensed the glory of God on this people, and people came into God when they came into fellowship with them. Brothers and sisters, it's my heart for a people of God, that it be so clear the presence of God is there. They don't care about their stuff. 
they have a hunger for the word of God because they want to live it. And that the testimony of the spirit is so strong that people understand these, that they're coming into a habitation of God himself. I believe that's what the Lord wants. I believe the Lord is going to get that for those who have reset their heart on the one thing of loving him before and above all else. And so we have a story which I've made uh, loose reference to in Acts 4 and 5, which I'm going to look at in a little more detail to communicate the point I've, points I've already made. And here I'm trying to explain that when our hearts and are entangled in things that are not directly related to the kingdom, that we lose perspective and, the, and the, we actually limit the ability for the Lord to make himself manifest. No revival is going to work around our hearts. It may work on our hearts, but not around our hearts, so that we have experiences and we have a sense of presence and, and there might be some other manifestations, but if there is not a reset of the heart where we say, I get it, I get the great commandment now. It makes sense for me that my whole life is God I love you with all my heart, with all my mind, how I think, what I'm thinking about, with all my soul, with all who I am as a human being, with all my strength, everything you put to my charge, I wish to offer that up in love, all of it, all of it, all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my strength, all my body, all that I am, so that Paul, when he says, what is appropriate worship? It is the giving up of your body as a living sacrifice. That's what the great commandment is. That's what worship is. It's loving so you, that expresses you know who is worthy of love, the greatest of love, and you long to give yourself to that. That had broken open on the early church in this revival, we'll call it, at Pentecost. And in Acts 4, 36, Gives a little story, a little example. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, and who owned a tract of land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. He wanted to go for the needy among them, or some other particular purpose. But anyway, he sold a great, you know, he gave a great deal of money. He really wanted to do that. He didn't feel guilty. There's no sense that he felt guilty if he didn't do this. That's what love looks like. We talk about what is the fruit of revival, generosity, not caring about material things, loving God with the fullness of your heart, attitudes, directions. Now, chapter 4. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. So he's saying, kind of like Barnabas, and this is the impression that he definitely gave. Um, I sold this land for my brothers and sisters. I want to offer this because I love them, I love God. And see, here I am, I give this to you. But Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? Wow, that's kind of, kind of extreme, right? Well, he, yeah, he fudged, he lied, he didn't, give it, he didn't give it all, but he gave a lot, he gave a lot, maybe a lot more than people give today. And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, you lied to the Holy Spirit because you kept some of it back. Because you kept some of it back and you presented yourself as if you gave it all. See, that is an attempt of a tweak. I mean, why would, that, why would they do such a thing? 
Why? One is that they had a greater fear about what people thought about them than a consciousness of who God is. They were right in a true revival, weren't they? It's not like, oh, we need better preachers. They got the apostles. We need more of the Spirit. They had the Spirit. They saw signs and wonders. They saw many people come to the Lord. They were in the temple. In fact, the mystery is they are the temple. But they made tweaks based on their fears and their loves. I'm sure when Ananias heard this, he, said, uh, he would have said, I didn't lie to the Holy Spirit. I lied to you. And let's know, let's, let's not get very egotistical here, Peter. You are not the Holy Spirit. But Peter knew that they had become a holy temple, that they were set apart by God for God to dwell among them. Just like in Isaiah, the people were praying and they were offering up their prayers and they were doing it just right. And God says, you know, your sacrifices, just keep them. Eat your oxen because you're slaying them is just now an act of great idolatry because I know where your heart is. In the right place, physically, in the wrong place, in their heart, changes everything. That's why the heart is everything. It's not always our thinking, brothers and sisters. It's our heart of hearts. And we need the assurance by the Holy Spirit that we are abandoned to the love of God. So Peter says, you know, you... The Holy Spirit, and to keep back some of the price of the land. Verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? In other words, no one's forcing you, to, forcing you to do this. And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? What happened to you? What led you astray? You see, you have to watch your heart, brothers and sisters. It has to be so filled with the love of God and so aimed in that direction that we will be protected from such temptations. But if we don't watch over our heart, things get in. You have not lied to men but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down, breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. They just dropped dead. And you might think, well, gee, you know. And then it happened again with his wife. Same thing. What you think? Luke, why did you put it twice? Because I want you to hear it. I want you to understand, though you may not see this today, it is God who is present. Paul sees it, that when the Eucharist is celebrated and people are not united with their hearts to God, they fall asleep prematurely. That is, they die. They, that's the euphemism in the Semitic language for dying many times, that you die. Or you die before your time. That is a part of covenant curse. Brothers and sisters, I think we don't tremble at the word because there is this way that we have to repent and get perspective and ask the Lord to re-educate our heart about who he is and who we are. Because one of the judgments that the prophets had, had said clearly that the voice of God you will not hear because of your lack of response. So when we read Malachi, we may not know that there are 400 years before the New Testament. Them not hearing the voice of God in such a way that we'd put it as a part of the canon, 
them not hearing the word of God on the same level of the prophets and what was written there in the scriptures in the Old Testament, them not writing it down is because it was not worth being written down because they were under a curse because of their dullness of spirit because they did not respond to the voice of the prophets. They did not respond to the word of God from their heart. They knew the words. Numbers had memorized the words. Heart, heart, heart. It's always the heart. The home is in the heart. Odd is after our hearts. The joy is in the heart. I want to experience the glory of God in the presence of God. I want to hear the word of God and I want to have it be very meaningful to me. I know that this happens as I become clear that my whole life is about loving and following Jesus Christ with absolutely everything. And I also know that the greatest joy that you and I can experience is having an assurance by the Holy Spirit that the disposition of our hearts is to be entirely abandoned. Why does not the word of God have power? Because we have truncated and adjusted the words of Jesus for our time and our place. So Jesus says, come and follow me. And we think, and he tells us, you know, that you have to deny yourself. And we think, well, gee, I don't know if I really want to do all, all that. Maybe I can give more than I have. And he says he picks up, pick up a, a cross and follow him. They go, oh, man, that can mean death. Well, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I want to die for Christ. Uh, I, could, I could give more. I could give more. It's just maybe some more. And he says, follow me. And then we say, well, well, what will I get if I do that? That's how it works. But the thing that if we see rightly, we think, my goodness, God came in the flesh. He's saying, come and follow me. And when he says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me, we say, you mean I could have this relationship with the Son of God? And he's personally inviting me into this union with him to become like him? Lord, look at my life. Look at my whole life. Where in my life could you have more room that I might hear you better? Where in my heart can I repent that I might receive your word for what it is, that it might have the power to change me because that's what I want because see our soul says to us God is not boring never give a testimony to anyone that he's boring by the testimony of your life the testimony of our lives should make it really clear that we just love to be abandoned to God we love to seek him because he wants to live with us. And that's what I want. Not just in heaven, but now and ever. So brothers and sisters, we have to be vigilant and we have to be awake to receive everything God wants to give to us. And he wants to give us, well, his disposition is, I've already given you everything. You see, we don't have to worship him to get stuff. He gave us everything already. But we have to make, give him room so he could rest with us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit,
We rely upon you to help us in this. We love you, Lord. We want to love you deeper and with greater authenticity. We want to love you with our whole lives. We want you to have a freedom to express your glory among us. We want you to have the freedom to continue to transform us, that we give a living testimony that you are alive and that you live within us and among us. What I ask, I ask that you would give us a greater hunger for what truly feeds us and that you would heal and retrain our hearts so that they would move toward life and that we might revere you for who you are, the great I am, the eternal God who has designed us for eternity. Spirit of God, I pray that you would superintend our dreams in our wakeful hours, speaking to us and reminding us of your desire to inhabit our lives to a greater degree. And that Holy Spirit, that you would give us the wisdom where, how to repent. And that you would give us the increased strength to make choices that look like wisdom. Lord, we thank you that you do hear us, that you are merciful, and that your word can raise the dead. And we are asking that that word raise whatever is dead from us and off of us, that we might live in the full of who you are.